gets picked up after right. the um, The one thing I would say is what cracks me up is I will get like web pages that fake like you have a virus so that oh, you yeah. download. Well, those there's are the they're, they're like and all that. Well, yeah, but I've seen them. I've been surfing on, my, on the Mac, and I will get like. You have a registry error, and it's always like, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm on Windows. I'm not on Windows, so it's like, come on. Right, right, right. All right, today what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at the um, flag quiz game, and we're going to focus on a couple things. We'll, we'll, look at the, we'll look at all the code, you know, just because it's good to review and to practice reviewing the code. Our focus is going to be on two things. Our focus is going to be on the menu, and it's going to be on the animation, because that's two of the things that are new in this particular example. So, let's bring it up. And we went over the animation last time, but I do want to spend a minute reviewing. The animation, this particular form of animation, is controlled via an XML file. And the XML file has certain things that it can do. And in this case, it talks about moving the, the particular thing, moving it uh, along the x and y axes, axi, whatever you would call it. And notice that we have this XML file, and again, it's almost like the layouts where you have this XML file that describes some stuff. We need to sort of bring it to life. We need to wake it up and bring it to life. Just like we inflate um, our XML for the display, or we set our main activity view from the XML, those things bring the XML to life for our layouts. All right? Here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I thought I saw the other night when it was referencing this uh, shake animation. Uh-huh. Yeah, to use a, yeah, you use use a file name. Right. Right. Yeah, for example, yeah. What that is that load animation is looking for a file name. And again, that file name, where is the file name? It's in our resource animation correct shake. Um, much like our layout main is referring to a file name. I believe as long as you specify the path, it would be fine. As long as, it, yeah, I, I have I've not tried that, but I'm pretty sure that if you if you gave the path, um, that would try. One thing I would like to say, um, I, I notice that Martin is in here, or Mar Martin Ridgeville, as as he is known as uh, here, uh, is in here. But if there's ever an occasion that you are sick, out of town, whatever, and you want to view the lecture by Skype, you're welcome to do so. All right, so. I know he isn't here today, but like if you're sick or whatever and you want to do that, feel free to, you just let me know in advance. All right. Yeah, that, that's actually why we did, that's actually why I made that offer to you, so we could mute your microphone. It's harder to do in person because you're not speaking over a microphone, but at any rate. Yeah, it's just Mike.Zellers. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, so again, we have to bring that XML to life. And the way we do it is with our little XML animation factory that takes our XML file and makes an actual animation object. Notice we have a shake animation and a nod animation. And both of those get created, get brought to life 
by loading it through this animation utility to load the animation from the XML file. All right. Then we can set the number of repeats um, in it. <coughs> we then, whenever we want to do an animation, we can specify for any control, all right, any view, like for example, way down here where we look to see if it's right or wrong. Oh, <laughs> I would say Norman Worth is a, yeah, that sounds like a legitimate name. Yeah. All right. Um, all we do is we can apply that animation to any view we want to simply by saying the view dot start animation and we specify the name of the animation object. So the flow goes, XML defines the stuff that we're going to do in the animation. The animation utilities load animation takes our raw XML file and makes an animation object. And then we can apply that animation to any view that we want to. So here we're applying it to two views. Also again, we can associate a couple different animations with a view. So I associate the right, the correct, yes you got it correct animation and the no you got it incorrect animation, both with these views depending on whether it's right or wrong. I would encourage you to play with uh, this and see some of the things that you can do. Uh huh. Um, I have a lot of interpolators for this. Right. But no real, like, I mean, I was probably looking at one of their other sites, but the documentation sketches, like, how to actually use it. Mm -hmm. So, but they had one that was a bounce interpolator that I wondered could have worked better for your correct instead of the one that you designed. So. Oh, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, um, the idea is that we're looking at um, just the mechanics of how to do this. You know, anything that we do could be done any number of different ways. Um, all of these have, you know, the ability to fade in, fade out, to scale, to translate, which is move it, and to rotate it. So you can go in, and again, I would suggest that you play around with this to um, do this. So, for example, um, if we wanted to rotate it, we could go in and we could put in, I'm just going to copy some of this code into our successful animation. And remember, based on the offset, that we have, it will do it starting at that point. That way we can make animations go together or we can string them in sequence. These three translates will go in sequence because each one of them is 100 milliseconds long and we're scheduling the second one to happen after 100 milliseconds. We're scheduling the third one to happen after 200 milliseconds. So I could make this as a duration of 300 and we're going to rotate this certain number of degrees and um, let's just run it and see what we get. It's based more on the offset. So in other words this one, the rotate has no offset. So that will start, uh, that will start immediately along with this first translate. Whereas the other two have offsets, so they'll delay that amount of time before they begin. I did get your labs too graded finally after that. Um, again, I, I did make the suggestion either before or after class you can show me your labs because that is a challenge sometimes as far as me having to download new SDKs and make 
tweak files and, and all that. I do have, um, I don't have installed on a laptop, but I have installed on my desktop Android Studio. So I've been reviewing things in that and also in uh, Android um, or um, in Eclipse. All right. All right, what flag is this? I'm guessing Panama. Nope, Ecuador. All right, so it did it and it kind of tilted it 45 degrees. If we wanted to go all the way around, we could go and make this maybe uh, from zero degrees to negative 360 degrees. And that should rotate it all the way around. And let's make the duration 600. And let's make the offset 300. So it doesn't do any rotation until it's done with the other two things, or the other three things. This is a fun thing, you know. Go and, and have a blast with All right, guess the country again. All right, that's not Italy. I don't think that's Algeria. We'll say it's Moldova. <laughs> All right. So we have the ability to do all those wacky things with it. And again, by controlling the offset, you control the sequence, and you can do this and other things. You can fade in by changing the alpha. You can uh, fade out. You can um, resize it, make it bigger, smaller, whatever. All right. I don't remember exactly where we got to with the menus. Just started the menus? OK. So let's go and let's take a look at them because again, that's the, that's the other important thing, defining important as something that we haven't seen before in a previous example. All right. We have associated with the activity we have two methods that we're going to use for our menu. One of those methods is on create options menu. That's what gets fired up when I click the little option menu in Android. That's this guy right here. So I pop that up and I get the menu down there. Or I can close it. I don't have to code that. That is, that is a, the, the, the basic default behavior. If I don't code that, what happens? Well, that's a good question. One of two things happens. No, I know what happens. Let's bring up favorite Twitter. I click the menu, the options menu, nothing happens. Because we haven't seen that code. We, we didn't put that code in this example. So when I click it, nothing happens. Yes? Um, there are different ways to invoke options. This is one of them. There's a lot of things. Yeah, you can, you, a lot of alternatives you can do. All right, this is, this is one of them. I just built a 
What are the three buttons that you have at the bottom? I have the, the go back, the home, and the show. Right. All right. At any rate, with this, with the menu, um, we have on create options menu, and that happens when you click that options menu button, assuming you have it. This is what adds the two selections to the menu. All right. The key thing here is, notice again we have our name of the menu option is in the string collection. We have assigned to this menu IDs. All right. That menu ID is going to become critical because that menu ID is, go is going to let us um, uh, define or, or determine rather which menu selection someone made. All right, and they define these as constants: private, final, int, choices menu equals menu first, which I assume is zero, and then private final int regions menu ID menu first plus one which would be one why they did why what does it mean first of all that they call that final what does that declaration mean it means you can't change the value all right why do we make this final why do why do we make this variable final as opposed to making it just a regular int Yeah, you, you don't want to accidentally change this. You don't want to change these numbers think, or someone that's going to come in later and maintain it to think that they can go and change it. Because if I went in and I tried to change it, it would give me a compile error. It wouldn't compile because that's final. Another word for this in other languages is this is a constant. All right. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would be a constant, yeah. And again, they use a convention, which I like, of capitalizing it, all right? Capitalizing it sort of allows us at a glance to tell, hey, that's, that's a, a constant, that's not. Now again, I've spoken a little bit about this. Um, I've worked at places that had very strict standards for naming stuff, all right? And I've worked at places where there is less strict standards. Um, I'm not going to impose a standard on, on you, but whatever you do, try to do it with some consistency. So, um, a lot of times I will, when I create variables, I'll put a quick indication at the beginning of what type it is. All right. Um, in the old days, one of the places I worked had a standard where you would define whether it was a local variable, a global variable, or an instance variable. So an I, so a string that was an instance variable might be ISTR, and in the name of the purpose of it. Whereas a string that was a global variable might be GSTR, all right, and a local variable would be LSTR. In my mind, you know, I'm gonna, not going to teach one because that's definitely not standard, but it does help to have some sort of naming convention for your variables simply for that reason. Right. Right. So yeah, there, there is, yeah, that, that tends to be that. Uh, for methods, you capitalize, um, yeah, you lowercase for the first one, uppercase for, for that. For methods are always capitalized first. Oh, really? Well, okay. I don't know why Android is doing it like that. It, probably because that's the way the OS is written. Yeah. 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 Because you're right. If you look at Android methods, no, set text is lowercase. That might be a, either Android or Java thing. Yeah. I've always used right. Then methods uh, names are capitalized. Right. 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 And that's why. 
that's why I was saying, I don't know if that's yeah. like an Android thing or a Java thing. I think that's a Java thing, yeah. I think that's sort of the Java standard. All right. At any rate, if we look at this, and you, you asked an intriguing question, because I know there's newer ways to do menus than this. Um, and let me Google real quick Android. Options menu alternatives. Beginning Android 3.0, Android Power Devices are no longer required to provide a dedicated menu button. With this change, Android apps should migrate from a dependence on the six item menu panel and provide an action bar for common user actions. On Android 3.0, present as an action bar as a combination of on screen actions and overflow options. You should migrate to an action bar. Right. Right, and the options are there. This would actually be a good thing for us to um, look at doing. Um, in uh, a future assignment to convert this to use the um, use the the menu. The way they're describing it, it looks sort of the same way, but slight differences. But that would be that would be a good one possibly for us to discuss next week on how to alternatively use. Basically, all I did was you have to create a um, just another XML. You just played it the same way that you were playing. Right. The answers in the scorecard. Mm -hmm. So that's all it was. Just creating an XML. Okay. Just calling that get menu and play there. Play right. And play that, and then just the then the rest works the same way. Really right. Okay. Comes. All right. So, yeah, that, that'll be a good one, though. That will be a good either exercise for us to do um, Tuesday or a lecture or, or whatever. All right. So you might do this a little bit differently for newer versions, but the textbook, as this was written, contains the older one, so we'll talk about that and we'll do the adaptation of it. So this code might look a little different is the bottom line to create that. The second method that's important is the on options item selected method. And this is where we use that item ID and that is apparently the same. same yeah, exact uh, same exact thing for that. All right. So, what do we have? Remember, this method and again, it's nothing I coded, right? It's part of the Android framework that when you make a menu selection, this method gets called and it gets passed the menu item that got clicked, got selected. All right? That menu item has an ID. Where does it have an ID? Well, in our case, it has an ID because we created it with an ID. All right? Now, we look and we evaluate based on that ID and if they chose this choices menu ID which is the first option then we are going to grab a list from our strings array of the number of options that the user can choose between. If you remember the user can choose either three, six, or nine all right. So, we grab that array. We pop up the alert 
dialog builder, we set items and, and to back up a second, we, we create a um, we set the items in our choices builder to that array. And we set an on click listener for this. And this on click listener takes the value from the array and divides it by three to determine how many selections there are. So let's look at that. We'll look at it first executing on the first executing on the um, on the device then we'll look at it um, code wise and I realized now oh you can't see the code my mistake all right let's go here so I press the options menu it pops up select number of choices select regions so what is that what method got called the on create menu method got called. Or, I'm sorry, on create options menu method got called. We click one of these two. If we click the first one, then the ID for that first one gets passed. The, actually, that first menu item gets passed to the on options item selected. We pop up our three choices, which comes from the string file. And when we pick that, we go back and reset the quiz based on that many choices. All right. So let's look at that. First of all, we have in our strings file, are three choices. The three choices for the number of guesses are three, six, and nine. Okay? So, if they've chosen that they want the choices menu, we grab that array from our strings file, we build an alert dialog, we set the items from that array all right and we set an on click listener so that when they click on this we grab the position of that do a divide by three and that gives us how many rows that we have. So this is actually storing um, the, the guess rows stores the number of rows we have. So however, however many selections we have uh, divided by three. Where is that item? That item relates to the position in our list of options that they picked. So it's zero, it's one, it's two, it's three. Well, zero, one, or two in this case. Now, Guess rows, then, is grabbing from our array either the first element, the second element, or the third element, depending on this value in the parameter or argument of item. So, if we've picked the zeroth item, then item will have a value of zero, We'll look in the array to determine what is the number of guesses that corresponds to item zero in our list. That is three. And then we set the number of rows to that number, three divided by three. If we pick the third option, then item's going to have a value of two. All right, the zero, one, two. All right. 
We then go and grab in the array what is item in position 2. Well, we have 3, 6, and 9, so in position 2 is 9. We divide that by 3 and we get that, they, that we want 3 rows. And then we call the method to reset the quiz. All right. So we set that as our on-click listener. We create our choice builder and then we show that dialog. And the rest goes from there. Questions about this? So we kind of have two things going on here. We first in the on item selected need to know which of the two menu selections they picked, either for the number of choices or for regions. And then we have to go in and if they pick choices, we have to pop up the list of choices that they have for the number of choices, either three, six, or nine. And then we set the on-click listener to do the proper calculation and to translate the number of choices to the number of rows. If they select region ID, then we're grabbing from the strings file the list of regions. We use that to create We're going to use that to create a list of options. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look to see if those regions are enabled or not. So that when we bring up this for the second time, it shows us what we've already selected before. Now. We grab a list of the names, we go through, we replace any of the underscores with spaces. So instead of getting South underscore America, we get South Space America. Then when we build our dialog, notice that we're not building a... We're not calling set items. We're calling... Where was that? Set multi-choice items. That's what allows us to pick more than one region. Notice the difference between these two menus. This menu, we can only pick three, six, or nine. This menu, we can choose and turn on or off any of the ones that we want. And then finally we can reset the quiz. So depending on the kind of menu you're creating, either you're giving a list of options that they must choose only one or we're giving a list of options where they can check more than one. And that will be depend on whether we are setting items in our dialog. All right, that's setting a single choice or set multi-items, multi-choice items, which allows us to pick multiple things. Then, based on our selection, we go in and when they're all done, we reset based on what they've clicked and what they've set. If they've clicked on the individual listener, I'm sorry, the individual region, we toggle the switch. If we click on the button, then it finalizes it and resets the quiz. Then we display the, re uh, the region dialog, show it, and we're done.
Now this is, granted this is a little more involved than what you need to do for your assi assignment, but it is important that we sort of understand and see the differences, the difference between the set, the items and set multi-choice items. In this case, we simply have it so that when they make the choice, when they click on 3, 6, or 9, it goes and does this calculation because the on-click of this interface, this new dialog interface, is simply grabs which row was clicked, uses that to look up what choices that corresponds to, and then sets the possible, or I'm sorry, the guess rows attribute. This guy, when they click on individual checkboxes, it either turns in or off, either turns on or off the particular region that they clicked on, and then when they click on the button, that sort of finalizes it. All right. Let's go and let's code this to do the menu the way that uh, Alan did, all right, for newer versions, where we actually go in and we create an XML file um, with the, the, the options. So let's go in, and how do we start? Oh, I, I created, uh, a new create a new folder called menu, called menu. all right. So we create a new folder in our resources, and we will call it menu. All right. And inside of that, I'm going to create a new Android XML file, and I'm going to call it options. All right, so there is our menu. Now, what do we put in this XML? What did you put in the XML file? Item. Okay, so item. Okay. And we'll give it uh, an ID. Um, and what are we going to call this? Option, uh, this is a choices option. And what else do we have? All right, I, I found that you have to do an Android semicolon order in category. I just do that with 100 as a as the way it is. Okay. Why not, why not zero or one or two or three? I have no idea. That's what I found the documentation. Well, what do you think they do it that way? Possibly the nest. I think the idea is, is if you were ever wanted to rearrange stuff. If you made it one, two, three, four, five, six, then what if you wanted something between four and five? Whereas if you make it 100, 200, 300, if you want something between 200 and 300, you make it 250. Basic line numbering. The old basic line numbering thing, exactly. Next. Um, then I just give it a title, so I said Android semicolon title. Equals. String, and we already have a string for that, right? And it is called choices, and the other one is called regions. So we'll go in and we'll make this one choices, all right? Anything else on this one? App semicolon? Right. 
You sure it's not a colon? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, colon. Okay, show as action. And then equals. And then that was never. Okay. Never. Interesting. All right, we'll do the same thing with this. We'll call this guy regions. And sounds good. Does that look like a proper menu? Now, let's see our code in the create options menu. On create options menu, we're going to go in and instead of simply doing the add to the menu, we're going to inflate this guy. Again, anytime we have an XML, we inflate it. That is, we bring it to life. So, let me... coming out this big chunk of stuff and let me Yeah, that's that's what that get menu in place. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Right. right. All right. So I don't think we're done yet, but let's see what we have so far. Okay. This XML NS intercolon app. Gotcha. Right. So where would I do that? Uh, up on top, underneath where you have that other XML NS. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the same tag or no? No, it's, 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 um, yes, it's part of the same tag. Okay. And what is it? X XML right. NS colon app. XML NS colon app equals. Okay. Android uh, backslash tool. 
right. Still has a problem with item. Where? Uh, same right where you were. The tools colon context. Uh, com, and then you do your package name. So com dot whatever the package is. Right, quiz game. All right. So I'm not convinced that this is, this, I know this is not completely right, but let's just see if we have the, the GUI part down. The GUI part works as before because I have that button. All right. You probably have a action bar on the top of it. How do you create the action bar on the top? Uh, oh, you don't have an action bar at all. No. Um, oh, it's in the, it's in the, mm-hmm.
Okay. So we have to change it to have to have an action bar to, to make this an action bar activity. Okay, you know, I didn't have to do that because I guess when I when I started the project, it already did it. Okay, so you, it did it for you. Yeah. Okay. I think I am. Import. Okay, yeah, because that's what it says when I was when I was on the time to write the menu uh inflator. Uh -huh. That's what says it. So when I got to blank activity. Okay. I think that it's, it's actually um, if supporting API API levels lower than seven, you have to import android.support.v7.app.actionbar. Okay. If supporting only API eleven or higher, and import android.app.actionbar. And we've been building everything to less than eleven. So. Okay. So I'm wondering if I do not have these classes installed on mine so all right I will work on this over the weekend and I'll get it going um, so that we can show it I uh, will restore it back to the way it was and we'll go from there the idea is is that although the details of the way we're going to create the menu changed um, to some degree, we're still going to code it in this on create options menu. <coughs> in this case, we take the easy way of doing it. In the other case, we take um, we, we go through a process of exp of, of inflating the, that, and and uh, and it will appear on the action bar, which is up here. So let me see if I have an app that does that. Yeah. So for example, on the browser. We have menus there. <coughs> so that's how it will appear. So that's sort of the new style of doing this. So um, we'll look at, at con uh, over the weekend, I'll convert it uh, to use that. And we'll come back and review that on, on, uh, on Tuesday. So again, live and learn. Um, all right. So 
Let's look at the rest of this application and see how the rest of the application works. And let's fire through a few scenarios. We'll start out with the starting scenario of when we first load up the application. Of course, the on create is going to fire up. We are going to set some variables. We're going to set our content view. We are pulling out the file names list, or we're creating an array for it, and the quiz country list, and the regions map. The regions map is a hash map. What does a hash map mean? Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's like an ordered pair, all right? Which means that it's almost like an array where the subscript is a name as opposed to a numeric value. So in this case, our region map is going to have the region name as the key, and the data is going to be a Boolean, which says whether we're going to show it or not. All right, so that is the region um, map. We're defaulting there to be one row of guesses. All right, remember we have the option that we can override that. We have a handler to provide delayed operations, and this will become important. This will be another thing that we'll discuss in more detail on Tuesday. We create our two animations. We've gone over that. We populate our list of region names from our resource file, our string file. Then we go and we sort of seed that region map. We're looping through and we're putting in for each region, we're defaulting that to true. All right, so we have a loop here. And we're looping through for each region in the region name array. This is simply a different syntax of a for loop. This is going to repeat this loop once for every region that's in the region names array. So the first iteration through the loop region is going to be region's name sub zero. The second iteration region's name sub one. And it will do that for as many regions as we have. This is one thing I don't like, but you should understand how this works to review code. Notice how there's no curly braces after the for loop. Yeah, I don't like that. All right. What that is saying is after a for loop, there is one line of code that gets executed. Pardon me? Oh, no, I'm just my head. You don't think it's terrible? It is terrible, right. So what we should be doing is to make the code more readable, we should put the braces around that. Strictly speaking, those braces aren't needed. In other words, a for loop, by definition, has for some conditions and then has a statement that we execute after that. So if all we have is one, one statement, we can put that statement here, whatever it may be. And it will go and it will execute this statement that many times. All right, whatever number of times is indicated in the for loop. If we have more than one statement, we have to trick it and say, okay, we actually have one sort of block statement that has x equals zero, y equals zero, or whatever. And we do that by putting it around braces. What I'm saying is this syntax is legal and this would be the loop. Because again, after a loop you have one statement that you execute. I would prefer always to use the braces indicating that that's the block of statements. Same thing is true for if statements too, by the way. You can have, pardon me? Yeah. Other 
I, I don't understand it. I think there's an old school programmer mentality that is like the terser, you can, if terser is a word, but the terser that you write the code, the better it is. Um, my philosophy is more of the more readable and understandable the code is. So I will, in some cases, write two or three statements out where you could write one that will suffice. But if that one is such a monstrous statement that it's impossible to read, then you really haven't gained anything in my book. It's better to go in and say, hey, explicitly do this, that, and the other. You see that a lot when they, when they sort of like chain statements together. They can do this, dot, that, dot, that, dot, that. And yeah, it works. But sometimes it's better to take the longer way if it, if it results in, in more readable code. And in this case, we're hardly talking about a longer way. We're talking about two braces, all right? Two braces added here that makes the code far more readable, in my mind, is, is worth it. All right. We grab our pointers oops, to our different things. We set some of the text, the text that keep track of how many, which questions we're on. And then we call reset quiz. So reset quiz gets called um, in three different places we've seen so far. And there probably will be at least one more. It gets called when we first go into the app. So after it does the initialization, it calls reset quiz. It does reset quiz when we make an option change, when we pick that we want menu options uh, of choices, three, six, or nine. And finally, it, it fires off when we pick what regions we want to see. So that reset quiz is responsible for um, starting the, squi the quiz over at scratch, resetting everything, and going from there. So important function. Let's look at that function right here. And what we're doing is we're grabbing the images. We're using an asset manager to pull. Um, we're going to be pulling the images. And we're going to create a file list. So let's step back for a second and review the structure of how this works. We have an array in our strings file that contains a list of regions. And those region names include underscores in them. Um, but we saw when we created the menu that we got rid of those underscores. So that instead of South dash America or South underscore America, it said South America. So we have that region list. Notice that corresponding to that re, uh, region list, there is a folder for every one of these. So for Africa, there is an Africa folder. For Asia, there's an Asia folder. For Europe, there's a Europe folder. For North America, there's a North America, and so on down the line. All right. We also have our hash table. And what is our hash table? Our hash table is each region and a Boolean that says whether we're going to include it or not. So remember, initially, all regions are set to true. When we first load this app, we've looped through on the onCreate. We've looped through. That was this controversial loop statement. And we've initialized every region to true. All right? Now, based on our menu selection, we can turn some of them off. But right now, we've set all of them to true. So here, we're looping through all of them. And if that region is enabled, so we're using that hash map to see 
Is it still true? We are looping through the list of file names and we are grabbing in that array list a list of the list of files that exist in that directory. So, Asset Manager, again, is a little helper class that allows us to get a file listing out of an asset directory. What is the asset directory that we're looking for? Well, we're looking for the asset directory that corresponds to the region. So the first region on the list is Africa. That's checked, all right? So we are going to go and get a list of files in that region, that is Africa, and we're storing it in an array called paths. We're then looping through that array and we're getting rid of the .png. So notice that the file names are africa-algeria.png, africa-angola.png, and so on down the line. So when we are done, we have a list of the file names minus the PNG. And we do that for each region that's selected. Now initially, all regions are selected, so we're looping through and we're grabbing all the countries and putting them in that file name list and we're getting rid of the dot png. Oh, that's okay. Now, notice this code is wrapped in a try block. Why do you suppose it's, it's, it's wrapped in a try block? Yeah. In a nutshell, going out and looking for files in a directory or in an asset folder is a risky operation. If you add two numbers together, that's not a risky operation. That's going to work, provided you know that they're both numeric data. All right? But in this case, going out and loading a listing from a directory could be problematic. So it could be based on corrupted data or whatever. There could be a problem. So anytime you do something external to your code, like going out and grabbing some files, there's the risk that it ain't going to work. And that's why it's wrapped in a try block. Because if something goes wrong trying to pull those, then we're going to get an error and we're going to actually log it. A good example of this, now ideally this shouldn't happen when you're running this code, but in development it could potentially happen. For example, if you notice we're following the convention of the region name matching the folder name. If I screwed up and called the folder the wrong thing, it would go out and look for a folder called North America, let's say, with no spaces in it, and actually the, the folder name is called North underscore America, and it wouldn't find it, and it wouldn't find that folder, and then it would blow up with the exception, and it would tell us some information. All right. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we are at the end of the line for today. I apologize a little bit for the haphazard nature of this lecture because I thought it would have been, it was worthwhile to sort of wing it and to talk about the way that new menus are set up. Uh, unfortunately, my version of Eclipse can't deal with that, so I'm going to have to go and, and do some updating and uh, or downloading some packages or whatever and we should be able to look at that on uh, Tuesday. We'll also finish with the rest of this.
Are there any questions? All right, we're done for tonight.